You're listening to the Speak With Presence podcast. I'm Jen Valenga, here with my co-host. I'm Jennifer Redley Thomas, and you can call me JRT. As co-founders of Voice First World, we are on a mission to get more women to speak with confidence in all their spheres of influence without being perfect. This podcast seeks to answer one question. What's stopping women from speaking up? It's a voice first world. Speaking skills are important now more than ever. Lack of speaking confidence is one of the many obstacles facing women who want to lead and influence at the highest levels. Even the most expert professionals can struggle when they have to speak on stage. They freeze up when they record video. They second-guess themselves when they have to speak on podcasts. Fear of speaking undermines their expertise. It can halt their careers. We want to remove the obstacles that keep women from speaking up. Speaking with presence is the key to leading in the digital age. If you want to know how powerful women speak with confidence, subscribe to our podcast. I didn't speak up, but that was not, it wasn't as though that derailed me. You just have to work on it. When I'm mentoring other young women, and even in young men. The saying is, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So that you are thinking about these things and and making sure that when they happen again, you're prepared for them. So they don't catch you off guard. So they don't throw you off your game. Today's episode features Yolanda Jacobs. Before we bring her on, I have a surprise. A quote about powerful Yolanda Jacobs. I will never forget the first time I stepped into Yolanda's office at the state attorney's office. To many, it may not have seemed like much, but to me, it was a war room. Her desk was covered with what looked like mountains of files and paperwork, all jockeying for her immediate attention. Despite the seeming urgency of each phone call and interruption by visitors to her office, She sat behind her desk with a power and grace that left me in awe. She was a steel fist in a velvet glove, fielding questions and solving problems as if she was born to do just that. She was brilliant in mind and spirit. Here was someone I had known my whole life, but had never seen this side of her. Her job was to advocate and give voice to children that had been victimized. Every day she fought for the least of these, a mission that was close to our mother's heart. That day I saw the woman I could be, the woman I wanted to be, understanding, strong, assertive, patient. How many people can say that they've had unlimited access to their role model their whole entire life? And while I'm sure that that was not her aim, that is exactly what she is to me, and to every young girl with whom she comes in contact. I am going to bring on that steel fist in the velvet glove. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Here's Yolanda Jacobs, a lawyer and partner in her law firm. Can I tell you, I called her right before, and I was telling her, I've got to do this. And, you know, she was talking to me through never, not even an inkling that she had talked with you guys. Man, is she going to get it? Wow, that takes my breath away. Thank you, guys. Women are so busy doing things in their lives that they forget to tell each other and also hear that they're amazing. So you are an amazing woman. I want to say before we get into a few questions, our sons were in daycare together and we became friends. And then when JRT and I were looking for some legal advice as we were getting our business set up, we called you. And before we finished the call, you said, I need to work with you. And we were like, no, 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 no. You're a partner in a law firm. You don't need what we offer, which is to get women to speak with confidence. So when you called me up and it had been a while, the timing of it could not have been better because I was just coming back into a more active practice in the law, but I was going to be taking on a slightly different role of business development. So I was going to be dealing not so much with, um, I, I would be, but not so much with clients and in the courtroom, but also developing business for the firm. So I'd be dealing with corporate counsel and businesses. A, a, a different take. And I had been out of the normal practice for a while. And when you were describing what you guys were going to be doing, I thought this is, it could not be more tailor-made for what I need. But I want to disabuse you guys of the notion that because I had been practicing for so long, 20 plus some odd years, and had reached a level of success that this isn't working with you guys is not something that everybody at various levels of their career could not use. It's been essential because it 
taps into, it makes you stop and think about where your strengths are, the things that you can work on. But most importantly, it's an opportunity to deal with two other women who are at the top of their game and to get something from you, that collegiality, that camaraderie. It's been just tremendous, I have to tell you. And fun. Well, that's one of our missions. We want to have fun while we do this. Yeah. Thank you for that. So I want to ask if you can tell us a time that you showed up with power, a time when you went, no, that was me owning my expertise. I've been thinking about this, especially working with you guys. And there've been a couple of instances. And if you practice law, you've, you've had those opportunities where you've been in the courtroom and you've won an argument or a case that you didn't think you would win. And, but you know what really came to mind? It was something a little different. Early on in my career, I'd been fortunate enough to get a position with a firm, a company that, um, you know, I was, I was glad for it. I had worked, I had been doing what I guess was relatively well, but there came a point where I realized it was not working for me. And I got up one morning, I didn't, I hadn't even really thought about it or practiced it or had a plan afterwards, but I walked into my boss's office and I told him that I needed to resign. And I walked out and I, I could barely catch my breath, but it was one of those moments where I realized that I could have stayed, done what was expected, gutted through, right? Like we so often do and been fine. But I think that was the scarier thing to stay there and not really maximize what I knew I could be, where I was following my passion, where I was going to move up the way I thought Um, my expertise should allow for. When I was thinking about that question, as I've thought about when working with you guys, that was the moment that kept coming back to me. It's not your traditional, you know, you've spoken with presence and your expertise has shown through. It was standing up for myself at a time and saying, this is not right for me, even though I'm sure if I'd spoken with friends, I'd say, what are you doing? You know, you've got this terrific position. Why are you walking away now? Particularly when I didn't have anything on the horizon to go to. But I just knew at that moment it was the right thing to do. And I needed to do it even if I was going to do it afraid. You do it afraid. Yeah. I was just talking to a client yesterday who was looking for another job and she she got kind of how do I say what they want me to say to fill the job? And so we actually wound around to, and her words, not mine, but she said, oh, I need to stand in my truth, whether or not that means that I'm right for the job. And I said, yes, that's the only way to get past spiraling around. What if, what if I'm not, not right? What if they don't want me? Have I said the right things? It, she said, I have to stand in my truth. Yes. And then you can sleep at night knowing if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. Exactly. And it sounds like you understood early on what your expertise was and how you could maximize that by taking that big risk and leaving. And I don't say that lightly because I know there are many of us who aren't necessarily in that position where we can walk away from a job without somewhere knowing what's next. But, you know, the more I thought about it, I thought my mother, my grandparents, my my parents, they worked jobs to put me in the position where I'd have the opportunity to do just what I did. And I think it would have been a disservice to how hard they had worked and jobs they had done that they weren't necessarily thrilled with to make sure that I had that opportunity to stay in that place when it was not the right place for me. I was sitting in somebody else's seat. It was not mine. And it was time to move on. I love that. And and to think I'm honoring them because of what they sacrificed for me to be able to do this. Who am I to be afraid? Exactly. I'm never going to forget your words because I think a lot of people that probably listen to this can resonate with what you said that I'm in someone else's seat and that's okay. Right. And my seat's empty (laughs) and I need to get there. We can speak up. We can speak with presence. We can, I think we've all seen the way it's supposed to look, the mechanics of it, um, or at least the outcome. But am I doing it in a way where I'm maximizing it. I'm doing it and I'm comfortable. It's me. Or am I putting on a facade for the audience that I'm speaking in front of? Um, And am I enjoying it? Am I getting something out of it? Or as I said, am I white knuckling it through and, um, and not getting the most out of it, not just for the people I'm speaking to, but for me. And so what I found is there are always ways I could do it better. 
And the other thing is when I don't do it perfectly, that I'm confident enough to know I'll get another chance, right? I'm not in my head about it, replaying, oh my God, I could have done that better, or that was horrible, or how am I going to face those people again, or I never want to do that again. You know, um, there's a confidence that comes with being out there and making those mistakes and not doing it perfectly and giving yourself a break about it and saying, I, what did I, what could I do better? What did I learn from it? Um, there's always something good that can come out of those experiences. On that point of who's your audience and who, who are you showing up as sometimes clients get really confused about that part because, you know, I, I trained actors for over 20 years and it's not that I want professional women to be actors, but remember in all of our spheres, we wear a different hat. You wear a different hat when you're with your girlfriends than you do with your parents or your children or in the workplace. But I think what happens is so many women don't really know who they're supposed to be in the workplace because if they're in male dominated professions, their models might be men. And that doesn't, that's not the suit that fits them exactly. Or maybe they've seen other women and they go, that's not exactly what I want to be, or that is what I want to be. But who am I to think that I could be that? Right. Who am I to think that I could be the steel fist in a velvet glove? Again, if you're going back to your own truth, yes, there is a way for you to wear that mask, that hat, a persona, whatever. It is going to be different, but it has elements of who you are as a person for sure. The beauty of it is I think once you give yourself a break and you recognize there's more than one way to do this, whatever this is. And if I show up genuine, comfortable, um, confident in my expertise, I mean, what more can you ask for, right? It's when you're uncomfortable because you're trying to be something that you're not or you're not, um, uh, you haven't kind of made peace with where you are and what you're doing that I think people, they sense that, you know, that comes through whether you like it or not. And then that, I think it's a snowball effect and it just makes it worse because you're constantly fighting yourself, um, trying to figure out what's missing, what's not firing right. And so, um, and maybe this is unfair, you, you guys tell me, but I think a lot of women struggle with that because they're so, it, particularly if you're in male dominated spheres, that there's very few role models for you. And so the more of us that show up in those spaces and are just ourselves, I think the benefit of that is you're, you're showing to other women, there's, you can do the same thing too. You don't have to do it just like me. Uh, you don't have to do it just like the the only other woman that you've seen uh, at the table. There's room enough for all of us, and there's a benefit from that. It's just such a freeing um, realization once you just try it. What's the worst that can happen, right? I agree. I think we forget that we are role models because we're still guess second second guessing or wondering if we're doing it right. And so, who am I to think I'm going to be a role model? I can remember my son one time. My my friend from Chicago brought her three kids, and they're younger. And I said to him, "You have to be a role model for them. Make sure you know they were toddlers." And, and I was trying to keep him on his best behavior. And he said, I, "I said you have to be a role model." I must have been saying that a lot. And he finally goes. I don't want to be a role model. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I said it too many times. But it's either we don't know that we are, we don't want to be, or who am I? But we have to stand in our power and own our expertise so that we can show the next generation that they also have power and that it's been done or it's being done so that they can pick up where we've left off. JRT, I'm I'm just going. <laughs> No, I'm floating out here. So I'm floating, um, taking in all this positivity. So here I am. Now I've got to ask a, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that I feel takes a little air out of the balloon, but it's real, right? Okay. Has there been a time where you felt your voice wasn't adequate? 20 plus years in what I've tried to do, because if you know lawyers, for the most part, we are constantly in our head. We are always rethinking that last thing we said, or, or um, we're very critical in that sense. So what I've tried to do is not be as much that way, right? Let some of those things that where I haven't done it as well as I would have liked, let them go. But one does come to mind. It was somewhat early on in my career. And we were, I had worked on uh, was going to be a pretty big case for um, the people that we were representing. And we had decided to, to pair up with a 
relatively well-known lawyer in the community. So we're very excited about that to work with him. So we end up going to this meeting and there's about, I think there were maybe four or five people were in this long conference room at the table. And I had done a, a significant amount of work on this matter that we were going to be discussing, but I was the only woman there. And um, I'm sitting down, we sit down at this long conference table and the the gentleman, he there was a younger, maybe teenage young man in the room and we get ready to start talking and I'm going to present. And he says, you know, why don't you talk with him and explain to him what's going on? He was a it was a, like a teen intern. It's almost like it had that feeling of being dismissed, right? To, and I thought it caught me so off guard. And I just sat there. I didn't say anything. You know, I didn't want to make a scene. This was a, this was a relationship that we were trying to cultivate. And you have to think about your client and, and that sort of thing. But I was just like deflated, right? deflated, angry, trying to figure out what just happened, a little irritated that nobody else kind of seemed to be seeing what I was seeing, right? And then you start going, well, am I crazy? Did I misread this? Was that not really what was intended? You know, the whole gamut. And I think back later and I wish I had said something slick or just the perfect thing to kind of turn that whole situation around and didn't. And I had to learn from that. I had to realize there are going to be those instances that's going to happen again. And how am I going to handle that situation? Um, you know, the, the saying is if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, right? So that you are thinking about these things and, and making sure that when they happen again, you're prepared for them. So they don't catch you off guard. So they don't throw you off your game. So when you ask that question, that was that's kind of been one of the things that I've thought about. And I've told that story before. In fact, when I'm mentoring other young women and even and young men, when you're new and you really aren't certain that you have a place at the table, that's when you can really get caught off guard by things like that. Next time being ready, being prepared for that sort of thing. But you know what? I, I didn't speak up, but that was not, it wasn't as though that derailed me. You just have to work on it. Those are one of those things where you have to say, you know what? These things are going to happen and it's not as much a reflection on me as it is the reflection on the, the people who do it. As we get more allies, male allies speaking up for, I feel, I, I would like to think that nowadays some man in the room would, somebody would stand up for that situation that just seems so obviously wrong now. In the moment though, I think a lot of people don't really, men and women alike, I don't think they know what to do. I think the people who quote unquote perpetrate those things probably aren't even cognizant of it, you know, don't have any ill will. And the, the other people that are witnessing it don't really. But one of the things I think the more we have these kind of get togethers and spaces is we can start being more conscious of it so that when it does happen in front of you, you, you can be that ally or that person that will speak up if the person who it's happening to doesn't or can't. What is the problem, do you think, Yolanda, of women not speaking up? So, so what if they say, I want to sit back. I don't want to be there. They're my son. I don't want to be a role model. <laughs> they don't, they just want to do their thing. They're not really looking to necessarily advance any higher level of leadership than there already is, that they already are. They don't want to speak up. They don't want to step in. What's the, pro is there, is there a problem with that? You know, on an individual basis, I think if you're honest with yourself, if you truly are saying, you know what, I, and I've been in those situations where I did not, I didn't feel the need to be the loudest in the room or make sure that I was the, the center of whatever the discussion was there. Were, I'm by nature, I'm a somewhat reserved person. I'm comfortable sitting back and observing and watching and, and interjecting when I feel it's, it's worthwhile to, and I've got something worthwhile to say. If that's truly the case, it's different. However, if you're, and you have to be kind of honest with yourself, brutally honest to say, is that what I'm doing? Or is it really that I don't feel like uh, I have something to offer or that I'm going to be taken seriously or, um, you know, you talk to us a lot about expertise. And when you ask me that question the first time, you know, what's your expertise? It caught me off guard because I thought, you know, I've been doing this for 20 some plus years and I could not quickly and easily explain what that is. And so often I've been in spaces where you feel like if I can't write a treatise on it, it's not my expertise. I shouldn't be claiming that I'm an expert in something. 
And that's so not the case. And I think that's sometimes why people don't speak up. Women don't speak up is they don't feel they have the, the right, in a sense, to. Men apply for jobs that they have 50% of the qualifications, 50%. Women won't apply when they have 98%. This is research that they've done again and again and again. Men go, ah, I think I, I can do that. Even if they can't, even if they have no experience. They're, I love to tell the story. When I got on Clubhouse, that audio social media thing, which I have not logged into in a very long time. But when it first came out, there was this guy, I was kind of looking through all the public speaking people. And there was this guy who was like, I am the best public speaking coach in the galaxy. But you know what? Hey, do you, dude? I mean, at least he's, he's out there saying it. Shame on us that we don't, (laughs) we don't kind of step out there the same. I wonder what is that? Is that we get signals from where does that come from? Because that's such a disparity, right? 98% of women versus, you know, men have 50% of the capability, at least on paper, and are more than willing to to throw their hat in the ring and say, I can do this. I get it that if your personality says, I'm good where I'm at, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. To your point about really doing some self-reflection about, am I staying back because I need 90% of the boxes checked. Right. I really want to step into influencing more. And I don't mean that like influencer. I mean, making an influence in your sphere, doing something, speaking up, having a voice and wherever you want to do that, your kids' sports, the PTA, the, in your workplace, in the conference room with four people around, whatever it is. If you're not speaking up because you are afraid or you don't think you have enough expertise to speak up, I would challenge you to to all of us to really think that through. I think JRT and I are questioning some things all the time about, you know, what are we leaning into? What are we backing away from? And what are the reasons for that? Do you see in your work, Yolanda, it getting worse? I I imagine most women who are lawyers already come to it with a certain interest in speaking up. I say that knowing full well that actors, you would think the same thing. And so many actors are introverts and they have to be trained to have confidence and speak up to do the thing they want to do. But lawyers, especially women lawyers, if they back off, does it get worse for them or or stopping their career movement? Because I'm a litigator and by nature, other female litigators, your your whole persona is not backing off, right? You're, you're, mm-hmm. you're we're not transactional lawyers. We're not kind of behind a desk all the day. So I, my viewpoint might be a bit skewed. But I think there's something to be said for the fact that right now there's such a push and has been for some time by the corporate world and the legal community to get more women in positions of authority, partnerships, general counsel positions. We're still doing that. That's 2021. So something is going on. Um, what that is, I'm not really sure, but you know, I haven't sat down with thought about it. And I don't know that I'd necessarily, I've been very fortunate. I was thinking back over my legal career and almost every legal position I've been in, it's been um, almost dominated by women, oddly enough. And I don't know, I, I don't think it was by design that I sought those places out, but they certainly, they existed. So when I worked at the state attorney's office, the positions I was in, the domestic violence unit, the special assault unit, they were predominated by women or headed by women. When I clerked at the federal level, it was a female judge and all of my co-clerks were women at the time. The the courtroom deputy was a woman. Um, Then when I went into private practice, that initial group that I was in, most of my my inner circle, the, the people that I spent a good deal of time with were other women. But yet and still you would hear in our kind of informal conversations, we would, talk about the the unique difficulties that we experience being women in a predominantly male profession. So like I said, something's going on. What that is, I'm not exactly, not exactly sure. And why there's the difficulty, why there has to be a specific effort being made to get women in these positions, why that's just not happening organically. Is there a powerful woman in your sphere who was a role model for you? There were quite a few. Right. So the the federal judge that I worked for, for me, was just such an incredible 
role model, not just as a lawyer, but as someone who was kind of navigating a, a professional space period, Judge Ursula Ungaro. She just recently retired from the bench and went into private practice, but I clerked for the judge in 2000 and we are still very close. She married us, in fact, my husband and I. <laughs> <laughs> I've been very fortunate to watch a lot of formidable, impressive women do what they do up close. And it's had a transformative effect on me. It really has. That's why we need more women in leadership so that they can transform the next generation of women. Yeah. I recall speaking to you before and that your mother had a huge impact. I hear her all the time. There's very little that I do, whether it's parenting or lawyering or anything that I don't hear in back of my head. And I'm sure somebody else said it first, but just hearing it from her, do it afraid. It makes such a difference. It's okay to be afraid and yet step out and do it. What's the worst that can happen, right? That you'll, you'll succeed or you'll learn something about yourself either way, but fear never killed you. We honor your mother. We honor your little sister. We honor you in that steel fist and a velvet glove. I love that she said that. And thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. I loved it. I love spending time with you guys. Thank you very much for having me. You too. Thank you, Alanda. Thanks for listening to today's show. A brand new episode will release every Tuesday. So be sure to subscribe. If you like what you've heard and you're interested in seeing if it's a good fit for us to work together, here's what to do. Go to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply to book a free call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes to get you clear on three things. What's stopping you from speaking up? Who needs you to speak with confidence in your spheres of influence? And how you can speak with presence to advance your career. School didn't prepare you for a voice first world. The less you speak, the more you fall behind. But you don't have to be perfect, and we can help. We've helped women across industries own their expertise, articulate their worth, and share their stories for the digital age. To see if we can help you, head over to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply. I'm Jen V. And I'm JRT. Let's talk soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>